we will get started because we only have 45 minutes and I'm going to need every minute probably. And I still won't get through everything, I'm sure. So this morning, I kind of have this weird talk. Um, it's something that I have been working with for a bit in some of the projects that I build. And that is data file structures, whether it be CSV, JSON, XML. <clears throat> How do I know what I should be using? Now, I talked with some people at lunch today, and you know, JSON's all the new cool, sexy thing. You know, in my day, all I had was CSV. You know, this JSON. So, in 20 years, you know, you young whippersnappers, you know, go, oh yeah, I remember back when we had JSON, and it'll be something else. It'll be some holographic DNA-based storage. You know. But we want to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, exploring different data format options, different ways that you can work with data in PowerShell and how you might want to decide which format would you use and what things to watch out for based upon that format type. Now, I'd like to think that I don't need to do this talk, but I know, and maybe some of you have friends or have seen these things in forms where someone says, yeah, oh yeah, I'm trying to do this thing in a CSV file, and they're jamming in all this structured hierarchical data. Now, most of you probably hopefully know that's just not going to work. But think, come on, I can't get this to work. Or they export something to a CSV and go, why am I getting system service controller square bracket? Well, so apparently some people need to be educated, so that's what I'm going to try to mansplain today. Now, one thing, though, that I do want to point out is all this data formatting stuff, and we'll look at converting and exporting and those kind of things. These are not things that I'm talking about that you would do inside your function. When you write a function, especially if you're building a PowerShell tool, you need to just write a structured object to the pipeline. Uh, converting that, formatting that, to, XML or JSON or CSV, that is done outside of your function in your control script from the pipeline. So I'm not talking and I don't want to see functions that export or create CSV data. That's not what you should be doing. Now, I know there are always exceptions. That's why I have the little asterisk up there. I'm going to be talking about using data structures that you might have to incorporate into your functions or tools. And then also, yeah, I've got this, all this stuff that I'm generating, and I need to put it in some other format for some other purpose. And that's what I want to kind of talk about. So yeah, so you might, in a control script, that's where you can have your XML and JSON and CSV and whatever other formats, you know, baby DNA storage, whatever comes up. So I want to talk about a little bit about how you might incorporate different data structures into your tools, and that's pretty much the only slide. So again, there is the link. So I'm going to go back to my trusty ISE. What the? What happened there? You don't see? No. Yeah. Let's try this again. You did see the slide, right? The slide was up. OK, OK. OK, so as soon as I, all right. Now, before anyone dings me, the only reason that I'm using the PowerShell IAC is for demonstration purposes. This, to me personally, is a much better presentation tool. I do all my coding and stuff in VS Code, so don't jump on me because I'm using the IAC. This is also much easier to see. All right, so let's say that you have a script. And it generates some objects like that. Something that you pipe it to get member. You can see, I've, even though there are no properties, don't worry about that. Just look at the types. So I've got an object with a, a date and a string and a integer and a time span and a double. 
Right? So we always should be thinking about objects in the pipeline. So let's look at some of the first things we have to care about. You can see my little comment up there. Type is probably the number one thing to think about. So when you are deciding work, what data format you're going to work with, one of the things that I always tell people or ask people is, who's going to use that data? How is it going to be used? Well, first of all, is anyone going to use that data? If that data is just going in a file and no one's ever going to look at it again, why bother? <clears throat> so we have to be aware of type. And this is what trips up a lot of people more than I would like to think it should, but it does. So I'm going to take that $A, which has all those fake members, and pipe that to export CSV. So I've now created a CSV file. And that's if you want to look at that, right? Most people have seen a CSV file. Now this is where it gets interesting. So I'm going to import that into another variable $B. And we look at $B. It kind of looks the same. However, right, we hopefully all know this, but in case you don't, in CSV, everything gets imported and treated as a string. Now, if I wanted to pipe this CSV to other things, and maybe my commands had parameter binding, and they had a type, yeah, that could probably coerce the object. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you need to be aware that you lose type when you export to a CSV. Now, I don't necessarily lose type for the type of object, that's that type data, but the different properties now, see, they're all strings. Which, if I were to try to sort or group or do something based on the type, that's going to fail. So you have some options. I shared some things that I've done in the past. For example, well, yeah, you can see that. I'm going to reimport that. And then for each line, I can just create a custom object and specify the properties and just cast the values as a particular type. So if I do the import and just pipe to get member, now my type gets restored. Of course, you have to know in advance. You've got to know your data. And that probably goes true of everything that I'm going to be talking about. You have to know what your data is going to be. You can't, none of the stuff I'm going to show you is going to work if someone gives you a file and say, make magic out of this. Well, I've got to know a bit more about what's in that file. But that's one technique. And yeah, you could probably build some functions or stuff around that. Uh, as an alternative, maybe you, you can build a class. So I can build a class called my data. The properties are the values from the, what will be from the CSV file. I can cast them as the appropriate type. I can create a constructor that then takes the values eventually that you'll see comes from the CSV and create an object based on the class. So I can import my CSV, and then again with the for each, call the constructor for my class, passing in the values from the CSV file. I've got this here. Boom. So once again, I get data imported, but you need to know in advance. What I would, if I wanted to go with this approach, I'd build a wrapper function around that. So I could just pipe my import CSV to new, or even, this would be a case where I could create the function, and maybe it's called import my type, or import my thing. And I can pass the, the path to the CSV file, it then creates the class and writes the object of the pipeline. So a lot of the code I'm showing you is just kind of like the bare bones. You would then want to flesh them out into more meaningful tools. So that's kind of my little spiel here on CSV. JSON, I guess talk long, longer and louder than Jason over there. So JSON's the new sexy. Um, and yeah, it's kind of fun, but there are some limitations, at least the way that I have worked with JSON. I can take my $A, which is the, my custom little fake object there, and I can convert that to JSON. Now, one of the things that you may not realize is, like with XML, you can control the depth or how, how far the object gets serialized. Now, in my case, what I have in my little $A object is really simple. 
but you can see that it serialized the date into something, and I serialized my TS, though, looks like a string. So I'm, kind of, I'm losing some type here. I'm going to convert that to JSON and then set that to a file. And now let's import that file. So that's $J. Nope, $J. And that's a little ugly, isn't it? So it kind of got the other values, and they look OK. If I have to get member, the date time got incorporated good. That's great. String, the integers, the value, little property, good. That's just, they have it as a decimal. I had a double. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, that TS, that time span, eh, I had a little trouble with that. So you might try, oh, and I have screwed up my demo already. Because this first demo was not supposed to have depth, and this was supposed to have depth. I'm out of my depth. OK, well, we're just going to keep going. Um, let's do $K here. So let's, oh, I better do all of this. I already have OBJ2 from a previous setup, so maybe this will work. Let's see what $K looks like. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So this version of the JSON file that I created earlier, OK, now a little bit better. At least now I have a string for that time span. And if I wanted to, I could then import that and send it to select object and then create a custom hash table and say, yeah, treat that TS and then treat it as a time span. And then send that to get member so you can see that now I have a time span for that value. So there's some tricks you may need to do in order to get data formatted the, the right way. And where the hell did $S come from? Oh, that's because I sent it to up variable. Right, so now I can use the data, import from the JSON file in the right format. I told you I'm flinging a lot of feces here, trying to get a lot done in 45 minutes. Now, you have to be careful with JSON, though. Let's say that I have my, I'll just do this first part here. So I just have a, this JSON file, right, so I can get the data from it. I can convert it from JSON, and then I say, you know, I want to select the name size. So let's send that to get member. You would think, in looking at that expression, it should have worked. But I got no objects. Now, one thing I want to point out, and this is what your clue is, look at the type name. And this is a great way, by the way, if you're running a PowerShell command and you're not getting the results you are expecting, pipe your, back off your, like your last command and pipe it to get member. And look at the type of object that PowerShell is writing to the pipeline. Because it may not be what you think it's going to be. And that's what's happening here. And if I look at $S, right, I, I, got, I know I have no object. I'm just going to get the content and convert it to JSON, and we're going to skip that select object statement, and let's see what we get here. Let's scroll up to type. By default, when you convert from JSON, you end up with a system object array. It doesn't actually create objects. Now, PowerShell will try to do what it can to try to unroll things for you, but sometimes it doesn't work the way that you expect it to. So the fix, and it's an ugly fix, is you basically have to pipe when you do your import and convert from JSON, you need to send it to for each, and then take each converted JSON object and then format it the way that you need it to be.
So when I do that, now I'll get the results that I expect. And if I pipe and get member, they'll be of the right type. Yeah, so this discovering the, the, the converting to, from JSON giving me not the object I was expecting, but that system object array that threw me and made me drink much earlier in the day than I wanted to. So those are some, at least with CSV and JSON, some things to think about. Um, CSV file, again, is a flat data structure. I, I could, we could spend a lot more time on this, but you cannot have nested objects in a CSV file. So don't try to build a CSV file with new user accounts and their group information and their mailbox information. Just not going to work. That's where things like XML will come into play. JSON could work for that because JSON will respect a hierarchy, but do not use a CSV file format for that. Now, the reason I'm showing you some of this is I'm going to share some experience that I had building some of my own tools. So I have here another CSV file. I'm just going to import. <clears throat> so I live in PowerShell. I have built all sorts of PowerShell tools to manage my day. And one of the tools that I built was a little reminder system. So I, this loads up in my profile, but I needed a way. And so my profile handle shows me all the stuff that's going to happen in the next seven days so I don't forget. As I was building this tool, I had to try to figure out what was the best mechanism or storage for this. So this is another thing I was trying to talk about at the beginning of my session here. The data formats is not so much how you might just want to, yeah, I need to save this file to XML so I can use it somewhere else. You may have data that you want to build or work with inside your tool itself. So I have my CSV file. Now, of course, my CSV file, everything's a string. And I'm dealing with dates. And I want to be able to say, hey, I need to know what, are the, what events are coming up in the next seven days. So I actually built a function. Here's called get tickle, where I import my CSV file. I have my date th threshold. I have a parameter if I want to see everything. What I have to do, though, is I have to import the CSV file and recast everything as the appropriate type. Now, I could, this, again, is something I could have done with the class. Um, I just did this with a select object. And I also have a command to create a new entry. So in this case, I just have to create an object. Now, here's an exception, because I know that my, I'm writing to the result of this is create a new entry in my storage system. Okay, So this is my exception to the rule that I'm going to get away with <clears throat> that's not writing this one object of the pipeline. Its end result is updating the CSV file. And then I also have an option to set an event. Now, this is where things get a little tricky. <clears throat> because in order for me to modify that CSV file, I kind of have to recreate the entire CSV file. Yet, I know there are probably things I could do with an ODBC driver or something, trying to mount it as a database and all that. But you know, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just use a database. Which ultimately, I'll jump to the, the, the cake pulling out of the oven. Ultimately, on my main laptop at home, my main system at home, that's what I've done. But my initial build of all of this was with a CSV format. And if I wanted to delete an entry, again, I have to delete the entire CSV file and recreate it. Of course, that always makes me a little nervous because something could go wrong. And with my life, it will go wrong. So I. Now, on the plus side, it does make it easier because it's just a CSV file. So I can put it in Dropbox. And I, as long as I have you know, this laptop and another laptop or my main desktop, and I can just point the same command so I don't have to, it's much easier to synchronize. So there's some value to, to that. 
I then decided, you know what, maybe I need something more structured so I don't have to deal with converting to types and all of that. So then there's XML. How many people are afraid of XML? Yeah, I used to be that way um, until I forced myself to use it. Same with regular expressions. Go, oh, I don't want to. Um, yeah, I used to think XML was a dirty three-letter word, but it's, it has its advantages if you take the time to learn it. And again, I'm not, I'm not, not going to go through all of this code. You can uh, try things out if you want. So what I ended up doing, and I've used the XML structure for some other kind of similar projects where I'm storing something that I want to track, and I use XML, an XML file as my storage facility. Advantages of XML, it's hierarchical, so I can have nested things. It can maintain type. You have options with XML in PowerShell in that you can use the export CLI XML, which is great if you just want to serialize something to use elsewhere in PowerShell. But most of the time, if you want pure XML, you have to use the convert XML um, commandlet, save that to an object, and then invoke the save method. And a little tip on the save method, make sure you use a, a full path, because if you use a relative path, it may not be saved where you think it's going to be saved. That's where using the uh, convert path commandlet comes in really handy, if you've never seen that before. But with XML, I can also use, so here's my entry here, for example, to, to, to uh, create a new entry. I can convert it to XML. I get a node object. This is a lot more complicated, which is why most of you shudder when I mention XML. On the plus side, now I know this will send some of you into spasms. Paula, avert your eyes. Um, select XML. Oh, no, ooh. XML is a great tool if I need to find something in the file without having to manipulate the whole file. So I could use the XML format, say, oh, I need to update my little reminder, you know, the, the date change. So I can easily get the object from the XML file, create an object, modify it, and then update the XML without having to rewrite the entire file, without having to delete it and recreate it. But there's definitely a learning path with XML. So that can be a little tricky, and it can be a little intimidating. But if you take the time, maybe that will help. And then your last option, even though this is not really part of the talk, um, is just use a database. You know, <clears throat> SQL Express is free, and that's what you should be using. How many of you use Excel as your storage facility? Oh, you all are smart enough to know not to answer that question. <laughs> well, I know some of you are, and you need to stop it. Excel is not a database. So just, um, I can't tell you how many forum posts I've seen where are people saying, yeah, I'm trying to read this stuff out of Excel, or I'm trying to write something to Excel. Well, we have a format for Excel. It's called CSV. So generate the CSV, then open it up Excel if you really are, you know, really need Excel to make your day. Yeah? I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that, that's a, but that's using Excel for Excel. I'm, yeah, Doug Fink has a, has a terrific module that allows you to manipulate Excel, but as Excel. I'm talking about the people who try to build, try to use like the, the Excel com object and read and write and open the file. Don't try to do that. Or yeah, look at Doug Fink's uh, Excel thing. If you are using it as a database, use a database. Use the free SQL. Uh, you can use SQLite. Use whatever free thing you, you can want to use. Now apparently the one thing I just read about that you can't do, and I've never really tried, is the Windows internal database is not accessible to 
us as scripters. Now I'm going to pound on that and see if that's really true, um, but I just read that this morning. So databases, um, and actually I, my, this my Tickle project is now is also up on GitHub if you want to see my final code that I am working with. Oh, using, well, the might just be using SQL. Yeah. Anyway, so those are my quick things here. Let me see what else I want to jump to. All right, this is, again, more fecal flinging here. This is kind of a catch-all session here. Any questions so far? No one's left. Oh, he just left, so. Yeah. To, to kind of recap where, we, where we've gotten so far in the story, think about what data you need to preserve and how you're going to use it and who's going to use it. Unless you, and the most, for the most part, your tooling should just write objects of the pipeline, your control scripts, the way that you use your commands, then you can work with the different file formats. Be careful of type. That's probably the number one thing that trips people up. Unless, you, unless what you're doing doesn't rely on type, then don't care, then don't, don't worry about it. But another thing that can trip people up uh, is working with other types of data files. For example, a lot of people have like a computer server list, just a plain text file. Nothing wrong with that. It's a great way to, much faster than querying Active Directory. But there's no guarantee that the text file is clean and usable. So as you can see here, my name's at text. I have a bunch of, uh, looks like service names. Some of them are indented. There may or may not be some trailing white space there. That's kind of ugly looking. Now, I should be able to, in the perfect world, get content for that, pipe it to get service. Doesn't, doesn't quite work for some of them, right? Because you can see, sort of, <clears throat> that it tried to parse the entire name. So like, first error there is cannot find servers with space, web client, then a bunch of other spaces, and then there's the closing tick. I also may have blank lines. So a couple of things you can do. One, a little trick that I use all the time is get the content where there is some value. All right, so they got me a little bit more. That skipped all the, the blank lines. You might still need to trim. So here I'm going to use the for each method, which we got in version four. So I'm going to get the, all the names where I have something. And then for each one of them, I'm going to use the trim method to get rid of the leading and trailing white spaces. So this oh, almost worked. I still have some line that has some blank character. But I got more of my services by trimming them up. You can fine tune this here with regular expressions. This is where they come in handy. So I'm going to get my list of computer names where the line matches some word character. And then for each item, trim the spaces, front and afterwards. Now I get the result that I want. So I can clean up my text file and not have to worry that my boss went into it and typed in a name but completely hit tab and were sloppy about it or hit enter or something. Obviously, that's a lot of work. So why not just have a function? So you can use my optimized text function. And this function actually even includes a parameter. Because maybe your text file, you want to have a line that's commented, which you want to skip. So I have a parameter that you can specify. And my function here will go through and filter where the line 
matches anything that's not a space. And I create a script block for that. And then I can also optimize for the, oh yeah, if you include a comment character, then here in line 29, I can update the filter string and add another comparison where it doesn't match the comment character. So using this function then, load that. Now all I have to do is just pipe, let me scroll down here, pipe my getting my content a list of names and send it to my optimized text, which then writes back to the pipeline. So I can send that to get service. No fuss, no muss. Works just great. Or, or this file, names.2, you know, maybe I have some comments. Still an ugly file. I can say, hey, run that, but skip any line that starts with the pound symbol. Find that very helpful. Yeah, because you can't trust anyone to make a decent text file these days. Any questions on that? That look useful to anyone? Anyone have people who make sloppy text files? Yeah. All right. Well, um, all right. I'm not going to run through all this demo, but another thing that might be an issue in trying to decide in terms of what structure to use. It shouldn't matter anymore because storage is basically free. But it could matter in terms of performance for other things. And you can run through the process in your own building to see which one works best is things like XML files have the most overhead. So you're going to generate a really large file saving stuff to XML versus you would to CSV or JSON. So go through your, uh, you can use this as a practice and see for yourself. I'm not going to go through the the demo, but look to see the size of the files that you get. Potentially, that might be an issue or a deciding factor for you in figuring out what format should I be using. Maybe, and it may be an issue because the file has to be transported somewhere, or the way the performance and how it's being used in the smaller file. You have to decide those things. But file size is also potential gotcha. All right. Boom, the next thing here. <laughs> I need more boom. All right, in the last uh, few minutes here, um, how many of you were listening to Jason and Richard and me bitch and moan yesterday? OK, so some of you heard my little uh, bitch and moan about ster creating sterile data. So that's my final little thing here, because it's kind of related to, to data structures. All right, so how many of you have a function that does, not the Active Directory part, but conceptually does stuff like this, where you've got hard-coded paths for an OU and domain name and a domain controller. Now, don't judge my code here. I just threw something together where I could ex explicitly put in bad practices. This is not necessarily the most fantastic piece of code I've ever written. but. You know, if someone said, oh, yeah, I wrote this cool function that gets Active Directory users from a specific OU, I'd say, share that. Oh, I can't because i got to go through and it has, I want to smack you because, no, you should not have written it that way to begin with. So I won't, you know, punish, well, I will punish you. <laughs> I should just get a Punisher t-shirt that has, like, no aliases instead of the skull or something. That would be. <laughs> anyway, so fine. OK, if you're going to do that, then maybe the next revision, let's get rid of this so that I can make this more sterile, more agnostic. Because what's to say that my company now gets merged with someone else? Now I have to go back and try to find all the references in my functions where I have my company.pri domain. Well, that's going to really suck. Or you leave and someone else has to troubleshoot and figure out why doesn't this work? Oh, yeah, we got rid of the employees OU during the last reorg. Okay, so there are lots of reasons for not 
for lots of reasons for creating more sterile, non-specific code. So let's say we, we start with that. You do have options, and it's up to you to decide what option kind of works best for you. One option, and it's something that uh, James O'Neill mentioned the other day, is you know what? Move all those, those hard-coded hard variables, just make them parameters. So I can take my OU, my domain, my DC variable, and move them up and make them parameters. Make them mandatory, so I have to put in a value. If I wanted to, I could put in a hard-coded default. If you do that, of course, you know you can't use mandatory. I'm still not necessarily a big fan of that because you still then have to go back. If something changes, you still have to go back and change that default. But what might be useful is define the parameter so it takes value from pipeline by property name. Because then, and I'm not going to run this because I'm not set up in my domain, then I can just take <clears throat> some CSV data. It could be in a file. You can create it on the fly. I just have a here string that's going to create CS, uh, a CSV structure and pipe it to convert from CSV and then send that to get domain user to my function and the pipeline binding puts all, all those things together. So I don't have to rely on anything in my function. My function just says, give me some data to work with. I don't care where it comes from. I'll just hook it up to the parameter and I'm good to go. You could create, you know, obviously controlled scripts or other stuff that would then use that structured data to call your function that you can control and should control, but your underlying tool, and, and also then that data could be reused for other commands. Because maybe you, ha you have a, a module you built for the help desk for working with Active Directory stuff. Instead of having all, that, all that's hard-coded, you could probably have one CSV file that they would then just import or have your control script pass that CSV data into the function. That's kind of cool. Or going one step further, how many of you use DSC and use configuration data? Well, you know, that stuff works for regular scripts as well. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, let me bring up the config data. You can create a hash table. You can do it on the fly and do it in memory. You can put it in a PSD1 file. Now, this is a data file. So I'm OK having hard code information, because that's the whole point. It's a data file. So what I've done here is I've created a hash table that has my OU, the domain, the DC, in a PSD1 file. This version of the function has a parameter, and I've made it mandatory, to pass configuration data to the command, which is kind of like splatting, which would be another approach that you could take. Then with in the function, I got a couple lines here. One of them is to import that data file. And there are a couple ways you could do this. This is the easy way now uh, in v5 and later. Import that PowerShell data file. And now that's saved as a variable dollar config, which is just a hash table. Then within my function, like down here, I cr I'm creating a parameter hash table that I'll ultimately splat to uh, get ad user. So then I just put in the variables that I pulled in from my config data. Again, nothing's in the function. There's nothing exposed that shows anyone who looks at this how my Active Directory is structured. Barring some custom property name, you know, if you extend the scheme, but I'm, I don't care about that. So now, I can import the, I can run the command, give it the path to the PSD1 file, I'm good to go. If I have multiple domains that I'm responsible for, I can just pass in the config data for the other domain, and I'm good to go. Obviously, the hard part, and it should not be hard, 
is you have to know and plan this kind of stuff in advance. But what I don't want people to do, and this is going to be my mission for the next year, is to get people to stop writing code like this, like that, where you have hard-coded values. So if you say, I've got something cool, show it to me, you should say, sure, I'd love to, and be able to without having to jump through all sorts of hoops. I have uh, some scripts I wanted to put up on GitHub because I'm new to be the unit member. And I have the SQL statements in it, and I don't want to post a SQL, but it drives the script. So what's the best way to handle it? I mean, should I just explain what it does and that and then take the SQL block out? Or? No. I mean, you can, the, the SQL statement is just another piece of data. So there's, it's no different than a domain name. So you should be able to use the same techniques here and just pass it through as a piece of data. Um, now, unless in your code you want to say, you need to write your own SQL statement that does this, that's kind of a, a gray area. But I, I, I see what you're saying. You can also pass that, that SQL file right to it and just keep that separate. Right. right. That, right? Yeah, because the more that you can make your code nonspecific, and because sh we're, we're, community is so much bigger now than it was even like two years ago, right? GitHub has just exploded and everyone's just sharing code constantly and that's a great thing. But I know a lot of people can't share code because they create crap like this. So don't create crap like that and let everyone, you know, see your beautiful smelling crap. Other Questions. Uh, so the PSD1 versus uh, <coughs> JSON or something, does it keep the type data and things like that when you? Well, the PSD1 file is just a hash table. So. Nested hash tables, right, as well? Yeah, you could, you could do a nested hash table like you would in, in DSC. Yeah, you can make your PSD1 file as complicated as you need it to be. I wanted to keep it really simple so I didn't strain anyone first thing on the last day. Other questions? Let me bring up the slide here with the <clears throat> GitHub things. Was missing. Yeah. So uh, on your, your code demo, what if you actually, instead of passing like config data, actually did a dynamic lookup inside? So say you do like a get AD domain inside of that command line. Well, the, the PSD1 file is static. Yeah. But you could use whatever code you want to dynamically generate that config data object. You can, no, you can set up the, the, the get 80 user, the get whatever, the custom user lookup. Or right, right, my function. Yeah, your function. So instead of doing a dynamic lookup inside of that to figure out what the base domain is, if you know what the OU is. Yeah, you, then, you can then pass it as, if nothing else, at least pass it as a parameter. Yeah. Um, but I, again, I, and I know you can set, hard, uh, set a default value, but I would be hesitant even for that because, again, that's something else that you have to go back and maintain. Once you write your code you don't, and write your pester tests for it, you don't want to have to go back, barring someone discovering a bug, and have to rewrite it or touch it again. So write it right, write it right, write it properly the first time, and then go on to the next thing. Yeah? What's your suggestion for uh I don't know. <laughs> Post it. Object. You could convert them to convert from JSON and then do a compare object. Yeah, I. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that you. That's what the PowerShell.org forms are for. Yeah, I. I don't have an answer off the top of my head. I'm. I'm sure it, it can be done. JSON is an interesting file format. Um, thing about JSON is, and with XML you got to be careful of syntax and case because you can get, that's another thing that can burn you. CSV is much more forgiving as long as you know that you've got flat data. Yeah. Does JSON have the ability to update it um, the way XML does? No, no. So the question is, can I update a JSON file like I can an XML file with the no methods? And as far as I know, no. The JSON file is kind of like CSV and if you want to update something, you've got to recreate the entire JSON structure. 
And for me, that I'm always worried that every time I do that, something's going to go wrong. So most of my commands that I build that use these kind of structures, I have a backup command that makes a backup copy of it first before I up do the update. Have you applied any of these techniques to YAML yet? No. But you could, I suppose. I was just curious if you ran any gotchas with it. Now, most of the stuff that I have deal with is XML or JSON. Um, I think I've even moved away from some of the CSV stuff for my little tools where I'm working with a structured data. Or I just have SQL Express running and I just do stuff in the SQL database. The, the challenge with um, like my, like the my tickle module that I have is if I want someone else to use it, I want to be able to install it and run it. I, I'm not a big fan of dependencies, and if I say you have to have a SQL database, well, then I have to add a lot more code to make sure that the table gets created and all of that. And, I mean, I'm working on some of that, but the portability of just saying, yeah, we're going to create an XML file, and I've got all the code that's going to do all the stuff for you, but you're just going to store an XML, that's fine. So, yeah, you can look at my projects up on GitHub, and you can see how all those things work. Yeah? Have you run into any um, techniques or useful things for working with really large XML files that you find worth sharing? <sighs> no. Um, you just... I guess if I'm looking for stuff, trying to really learn how to work with select XML so you can get exactly what you're looking for. There are ways you can use select XML where you kind of start at the top and then loop through to kind of loosely find what you're looking for. I'm by no means a master with select XML. I always have to go back and look at my notes or other code and go, how did I do that before? Um, so yeah, if you have a really large XML file and you're trying to find data, that's what select XML and XPath, another dirty word, is for. One more question. Uh, is there a, so in trying to make everything more portable, is there a good way to export a data table object that you can just import later? Because like they get a lot of the same benefits that a database gives you because you can just use you know, SQL to do your select stuff. Yeah, you can. Um, I think with the data table. You're going to have to make it to make it transportable. You're going to have to serialize it, which means you're going to have to put it in CSV, XML, JSON, some or some other structured text format, and then recreate the data table object in PowerShell. I'm not aware. I can't recall offhand if the data table object has any methods to save to file or not. Say you can like save the. Like you can save the table in the schema to XML, but I haven't. I've seen the methods, but I haven't really had a good chance to play with them to see how well they actually work. You might want to check the VBA tools. I think they may have something in there for that, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, or again, forms of PowerShell.org are your place to go. All right. Well, I think it's time for more coffee. Um, Everyone get pumped up and ready for Iron Scripter. And uh, I'll be around all day today. So if you have any other questions, come find me. Thanks for coming.